Hi, and welcome to The Scoop. Today I'm joined by a near and dear family friend who has a long list of achievements to his name. Coming from humble beginnings, he grew up in Nairobi and got his degrees in science and engineering in India and the United States. After returning home to Kenya in 1951, he found and transformed a prospering family business into a billion dollar enterprise that has a presence in over 40 countries, making him one of Africa's leading industrialists. In recognition of his philanthropy and his entrepreneurial endeavors, he was awarded a degree of Doctor of Science by the University of Nairobi in 1997, the Order of the British Empire by Queen Elizabeth II, and the Order of the Burning Spear by President Moi Kibaki in 2003. Along with being the chairman and CEO of the Comcraft Group of Companies, he's on the boards of several prominent East African companies with a vision to do as much good as he can for as long as he can. Dr. Manu Chandaria, welcome to The Scoop. Manu thank Uncle, thank you very much for coming. Thank I have you. to call you Uncle because I've known you for so long. <laughs> thank you. Manu Uncle, humble yes. beginnings, but you've been in Kenya, your family's been in Kenya almost 100 years now. Your yeah. dad came here in 1915. Yeah. Um, you were born not too long after that. Your dad was determined to give you the best possible education. Um, he sent you back to India for, for your undergraduate studies, sent you to the US for your degree. Um, Coming back, you saw, you know, you, you wanted to come back to Kenya. Uh, let, let me start with this. My, my father had gone only for three standards of vernacular. Mm -hmm. And he found it so difficult because he couldn't speak, read or write English. And so he found that if I want to have a future of my children different than mine, I must at least educate them. There's no way. My mother was illiterate until 53 or so. He started writing vernacular language. Uh, that impact on him changed the whole life. Mm. And that's what I think. That firm decision, without education, you're nowhere. What was your dad's decision to come, behind his decision to come to Kenya? Why did he choose to leave India and come here? Well, you know, they were living in uh, princely states in Jamnagar. Mm -hmm. And, you know, those states were always short of rain. Every third or fourth year, there'll be drought. One year good, the Maharajas will take away almost 50% of what we produce. So third year was very difficult. And fourth, you have to just depend upon somebody who gives you food. Mm. So at that time, the people from our community who started coming in here from 19, 1898, 1905, 1910, they started a few of them coming over here. And they found that here is a country. Everything is green and lush. You don't have to really, you, you throw seeds and mm. grow. Mm. So with that intention, he decided to come over here. Was that the, the goal for you? I mean, was that all you were going to do was to go into the family business? Did you have some other dreams, maybe being, you know, being a, a singer or a musician or something else <laughs> different to, to, to running the family uh, business. I think that we had a good businesses once upon a time, but by 40s and during the war, we lost mm. quite a bit of them. Mm. Uh, so when we came over here, we had two businesses. One was a wholesale provision shop in Nairobi, providing to all the supermarkets and the, and the shops, and mainly provisions. Uh, and the second one was Kalu Works in Mombasa, where 40 people were working. 40 people, six members of the family, 46. And at home, 36 members. You know, time and again we kept on feeling, what are we doing here? Is this the life that we want to live? Looking out of 40, and I was second engineer. My brother was, <clears throat> the, again, in another field. but. This is not all. But then it kept on dawning us all the time. Are we right in taking our decision that we're going to build these companies, we'll build our family, do a good business, or why don't we just get out? Mm. Your nine to five cozy job, mm. I had masters in engineering, my brother had technology, other cousin had a, a civil engineer. So, you know, jobs will be just like that. And then it came to our mind, hey, they had dreams. Our parents had dreams. They lived their life for us. 
to get, get us educated. And if you're going to drop them now mm. and say, thank you very much, I decided, no. What happens? Whatever happens, we will sit down and we'll make sure that we create wealth. Um, so how did you keep it together? Because that's often the one, it's the, it's the secret of the success of many big empires is, is the family sticking together. But it's also the, the downfall of many empires is the family splitting up. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think that uh, during, the, during the, my college days, that was the time when Gandhi mm. was having what we call Quit India Movement. And you know, Gandhi impressed us so much while we were in the university. We couldn't believe that this man could have wonderful life. After South Africa, he could have had wonderful life. He decided, said, no, I'm going to serve the people. He went around, half dhoti. Mm. And to join him, the very simple principles, you know, with the India movement is we cannot move British out unless we make and compel them to go out. Number one, don't use any imported goods. Number two, don't use any goods which are manufactured after the machineries and equipment from overseas. That limited us. We had to, we had to start spinning. For four years in our college time, all of, all of us, four of us, we just spun our own clothes and then gave for weaving. And we had two shirts, two pair of pants, two underwear, and that's it. That showed us the sacrifice in life. And if this man did it, and he, he got India independent by the time when we left India. India got independent. And not only India, but many other countries mm. in the world started getting independent. Now, what was the reason for this? Strong commitment, strong sacrifices. That once you decide that you're going to do it, that don't let anything come against you. So that was the first principle that we learned, that if our parents had sacrificed so much, then what are we? And you managed to instill that amongst Absolutely. all of the family Absolutely. Um, uh, to do that. We'll be right back with Dr. Manu Chandaria. We're going to talk about traveling outside of Kenya and his first experiences there. Stay with me. Hi, welcome back. We're here with Dr. Manu Chandaria. So Uganda, Congo, you know, how were those, those well, countries compared to Kenya at that time? Well, uh, Kigali. Yes. Kigali was one state. Yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Burundi. I stayed a year in Burundi. Yeah. And it's just, uh, I don't know, to me, it, to me it seems that, and, and, and from Nairobi, from Mombasa to Burundi, we thought that we are all, already 25 years behind, somewhere in the, in the Bundus, you know. <laughs> Uh, nowhere <laughs> nearby. Yeah. Uh, and and in Uganda also. But Uganda was much better than Kenya because a lot of investments was in agriculture. And the prosperity in Uganda at that time was quite good. So it attracted us a little bit more, but all of them. You can't so they, one might be here, one mm. might be very maybe it's five percent, two percent. But you saw opportunities in all of these places. Yeah. This was the, the beauty of it being so, um, you know, uh, underdeveloped was that there were opportunities uh, which you don't, maybe don't get nowadays in order to build a business the size of yours. Well, opportunities are always there. It's the only point that are you good enough to take advantage of advantage it. Of it. Yeah. Opportunities are never going to stop, whether the first film when uh, Henry Ford did his T model. Uh, he thought that, my God, I've done everything. Mm. Look at today's automobiles. And countries after countries mm. moved from US. They were the only makers of cars. And then today you find other countries are taking over them and they're making the most beautiful cars. So I don't think the opportunity is an issue. It's an attitude. You want to make it or you don't want to make it. When we started, with that 40 people, we created and thought, how are we going to create wealth? The word is create wealth, not work alone. Hmm. Create wealth. And how did we do it? After five years, we had 500 people working. There was no Saturdays, there were no Sundays, there were no holidays, there was nothing. Hard work 
down toward 18 hours. Find solutions to the problems that you're facing. Uh, money was impossible because it's a, it was British government. You go to a bank, you can't even enter a bank like that. You got to go through your agent. You know, you know. Because you were Asians, because Asians. of the, the, the segregation. Asians, yes, it's segregation. And then mm. Africans even can't even go near the bank. Even. Mm. Forget about going to the bank. Going inside, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So in all this, we try to find out which way we can grow. What is the possibility for our growing when everything, all the doors are closed? Almost all the doors are closed. Then we said that, okay, if the business has to, people need goods. We, let's produce goods. Let's give them. But we don't have the equipment. But we convince Japanese, we convince some UK people and say, come on, man. All you are going to give is to us, not to our equipment. It's giving to us. Mm. Where we are going to build, we are going to buy from you, we are going to produce it. Before we have to pay you, we'll sell it, we'll give you the money on time. Keeping promise all those years created a name for ourselves. Building your credit rating. Credit, credit, credit rating. Yeah. And, and then in 1958, 59, we had 800 people working. And it's, it's, you know, we were very happy because the 37, 8, 38 people, you know, 40 people living in, mm. in Mombasa. And somebody says, hey, just a minute. This was an advisor, an Englishman. He said, listen, don't bask in this glory. They, all these countries are getting independence. These are all your markets. All those markets are going to disappear because they want investments in their country. So you wake up. It took us about eight months or a year to think, hey, do we break everything and go mm. from here? But we made a decision either to survive hmm. and sent out our people, our family members, one to Uganda, two to Tanzania, one to Ethiopia, one to Zambia, because we had ample manpower. Hmm. Yeah. And five years of real hard work, we were in six countries manufacturing. That gave us an idea, it is doable. And this was just before independence came? Just before independence. Uh, no, from, from 61. From, from 61. 61 yeah. up so, to 65. so some of these countries were just That's becoming getting, independent. Yeah, yeah. And that was Tanzania. a risk. It was a risk that you took absolutely, because absolutely. on independence, they could have all turned around absolutely. and said, your Absol Asians absolutely. leave. We're going to nationalize yeah. everything, Ab which did happen in some yeah. countries absolutely. as well. Absolutely. Uh, we lost out. We lost out in three countries. Which in Tanzania, I would assume. No, that no. first we lost out in, in Uganda mm -hmm. when Amin came. When Idi Amin came, yeah. When Emperor Ethiopian Emperor died, killed in, in the yeah. We lost everything there. And to date, we have not got it. Uh, we lost everything in Burundi. Mm -hmm. And at that, that time, it's Rwanda and Burundi together. Lost everything because you can't go there. Yeah. It was just very too dis risky. Yeah. So we just forgot about and it. And Tanzania and Nyerere, did you? Yeah, and Nyerere was very interesting. Mm. And when he nationalized 68, he said, no, we are not going to nationalize you. Because you started now after we came into power in 61. He came into mm. interim government in 60, 61 they were independent. So you came after us with your money. We can't nationalize you. So he said, okay. But after five years, they said, but such a huge conglomerate of Tanzanian companies, we cannot leave it just to a private sector because of their philosophy. Mm. Mm. So he told him, take it 100%. He said, no, 40% you keep, 60% we take, yeah. but we will will pay you for the 60%. So Cooper and Libra, and they mm -hmm. made the valuation. Mm -hmm. And you don't take the money out. You reinvest that money here. And so we became very great in big, in Tanzania. Tell me how this all started. How did the foundation start and what do you do now? Uh, you see, the... The I'm first time Jane. Uh, being a Jane, mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to kill anything. I don't want to hurt anybody. Mm. And it's not only hurting by, by physical hurt. 
Mentally, I don't hurt. I don't think anything like bad of you. Speech-wise, I don't hurt. Physically, I don't hurt. So all the three ways, not hurt you. Now, that basic principle, though I'm not a religious man, but that basic principle of understanding the philosophy behind it is that everyone has a right to stay. Mm. Everyone has a viewpoint which you go to listen. That was the fundamental principle on which the basis was there. And so when, when we came back uh, in 53, I asked my father with my brothers together, we went there and asked him, Papa, how about setting up Chandaria Foundation? He looked at me. Is there something wrong with you? I said, what's wrong with me? He said, you know, you people have lived too long in America. <laughs> He said, we are not Ford, we are not Rockefeller, we've got a big hole here, fill it. Yeah. I said, listen, Papa, it's not the issue of that. The issue is fundamental decision that if you do make wealth, we don't have the wealth now, mm. but if you do make wealth, we need a focal point. That there is a foundation that will always draw us back and say, we have a responsibility mm. to the society. It'll keep you grounded. Keep us grounded. He said, come on, go. Get on to work. <laughs> go back to America. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. Back to work. Yeah. I'll listen to all your, hmm. whatever you want to say. 56 from 40 people when we had 500 people. That was 10 times. So he came back and said, okay, hmm. you know those ideas of Chandaria Foundation? my 10% of my company, hmm. Chandaria Foundation. And we started with one scholarship. But the ideology was that if I want to keep this family, or we want to keep this family, it's not me alone, but all of us family, if we want to keep the family, we must be on the ground. Hmm. More money, you're just elevated from the ground. You don't know the realities, no pain. We'll be right back with Dr. Manu Chandari. We're looking at what's next and the scoop as well. Stay with me. Hi, welcome back. I'm here with Dr. Manu Chandaria. Manuka, we were talking in the break a little bit about young people and where should they look at? What industries, what sectors should young people look at that are the future of this continent over the next two decades? Uh, first is that we have a serious problem on our hand. Not us, but almost all the countries in Africa. Today in Kenya, there are more than 4 million Kenyans, secondary school level, up to the university graduate, facing streets of Kenya. This worries me all the time. And I can't understand that why people don't look at this as a social problem. First insistence, yesterday was Youth Day, and I was asked to speak at the Youth Rally uh, and, uh, at, the, at the KICC. Uh, it's a United Nations Youth Day and Youth Week. And I explained to them, listen, neither the private sector can give 5 million jobs or 4 million jobs. Neither the government is capable of doing it. And these people are there. And half a million gets added up every year. What should be doing? So my thinking is first, let's make them volunteers first. So that they don't sit at home mm. doing nothing. Today, majority of them sitting home, discussing issues, talking about issues. You know, but volunteers, I mean, they're not going to want to, are you saying paid volunteers no, or no, free no, volunteers? Free volunteers because, because... I wouldn't think that that would work. Yeah, that's, it works in many countries. Mm -hmm. It can work even today here. That will give you a, some possibility of ultimately understanding what you are doing. Mm. Work teaches work. By digging a hole, putting a plant, by going in to the school, teaching them. That will ultimately turn into some jobs later on. But today, right. keeping our... 400, 4 billion people at home sitting doing nothing 
It's asking it's, for trouble. It's asking for trouble. It's a disaster. Which is what you're saying is we it's need to do across the continent to Absolutely. give the youth a sense of purpose. Sense of purpose. And then you start thinking about it. If, if somebody came and said, Mr. Manu, I've got 100 people here. We want to put 100,000 trees. Will you support me? Hmm. I said, go ahead. Now, somebody has to come out and do it. Hmm. We talk about one and a half percent forest cover from 11 percent. Who's going to do it? Do you expect that uh, World Bank is going to come and do it? No, mm. we are going to do it. Mm. So I think that there's a whole sense of purpose is lost out completely. And so if you don't give them a sense of purpose to live and to remain and feel themselves that they are human beings, they're wanted in the community. Mm. They're not just outcasts. And to me, I keep on telling the government all the time, you have no right to stop a person earning a living, taking food home for their children. You have no right to stop it. You know, every day there's a, this problem. City council throws away these people, puts them into a truck. You have no right. As long as I'm not doing wrong, I'm earning a living for my children, taking bread, on, on the table for me, for them. I'm not doing anything wrong. For well, and this is how revolutions start. Absolutely. This is this is what happened in Tunisia. This is what yeah, started yeah, the yeah, Arab yeah, Spring. Yeah, was yeah. was a you know one trader that was fed up yeah. and was harassed beyond his beyond, limit yeah, and yeah. decided to you know do something yeah, yeah, about yeah, it yeah, himself yeah, and yeah, and and, yeah, and yeah, put himself yeah, on fire. A yeah, yeah. little bit extreme, yeah. but it, it sparked off that whole region. Yeah. Um, how about you? I mean, what next for you? I mean, you've done 85 years of amazing things. What's next for Dr. Ne Manu Chandaria? Next for me is a legacy. Because there are very few years left now. Uh, there are many years. God willing, they'll still, be, you no, know, well, still well, be interviewing you in another 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a legacy. You know, a legacy bigger than the Chandaria Foundation? Yes, legacy is, is this sense. It's, it's Chandaria Foundation is a good example. Can I create more Chandaria Foundations from mm. everyone? that I meet, that I talk, that, hey, mm. if I've done it, why can't you do it? I did it one scholarship. You can do it one scholarship, two scholarship, three scholarship. You can go to the hospital one, one afternoon, one afternoon mm. in a month, mm. go and find out what's going on. These are the types of the way you've got to change. And you know, there was a, there was a, man, there was a, a dean of a business school and he, he and I can still remember, I called him here to give a lecture to the Nairobi University. And he said, you know, success, many of us are successful people. But unless success is turned into significance, mm. that success, success is mere success. And many of them, with their success, go away, past. Nobody remembers. But if you leave a legacy that, yes, I've touched 200 Kenyans mm. to give, if I created a, a, a small commune who are believing in giving, that's the legacy I'd like to leave. And the show is called The Scoop, Manuel. So, you know, you need to give me a scoop, something well, about you that well, nobody else knows. Scoop to me, the way I see, understand English, is to. Take a spoon, yeah. scoop it up, right? <laughs> I, tried, I tried to take with every man that I meet, something from him. Mm. There's always good in somebody. He might be very small, he might be very big, but I always take something out of him to add to my... And I feel humbled that way, that mm. I don't know too many things yet. There's a whole sea there that I have to learn. I scoop it up <laughs> from them and do and enlighten myself that yes, I learned from him something. I learned from him something. And see whether I can duplicate, triplicate, quadruplicate. Success of Chandaria family was, is purely, if you're successful in one industry, if you knew how to do it well, we set up one, two, three, four, five, six, hmm. multiplicity. Brain remains the same. 
know how remains the same, suppliers remain the same, and consumers remain the same. Maybe the different country, yeah. but the same. But the same. So, how do you multiply these ideas and thoughts? Let's take other people's, the best of other people. Best of other people. Scoop it up. Scoop it up. And that's the scoop with Dr. Manu Chandari. Join me again next week when I'll be talking to yet another great African personality. From me and the entire team of The Scoop here in Nairobi, Kenya, thanks for watching. Manu, thank you so much for thank your time. You. I you. hope you enjoyed it half as much I, as I did. I, I, <laughs> it no, was, no, no, was you're, fascinating, really you're, fascinating you're, story. You have been, been a role model. Your father was a role model for me. Oh, I thank and you. I, and I'm thank seeing you. that you are growing into that, those shoes.